So Diane is an artist and a model maker who has an enthusiasm for making working things work and the patience and dedication needed to sort pile of tiny little seeds into a block while also talking to 15 people on Zoom. That's quite impressive. A long time grower, community gardener and allotment here, she has been involved in the Bristol Seed Swap for many years and the main coordinator for the last few. I think she did one year pretty much single-handed. <laughs> That's, that's amazing. Her wide knowledge around growing food is helped by her willingness to tie bags around flowers and create bean barriers to avoid cross-pollination and preserve heritage priorities. She believes firmly in the need for more resilience and less reliance on big ag by saving, sharing, preserving, and repurposing. And this has given her an amazing skill set. You definitely want to be on Team Diane when the zombie apocalypse comes. So Diane, this is your turn. Um, I must say the introduction was written by a good friend who took the friend's prerogative of taking the mix slightly, I think there. But yeah, I um, find it slightly weird talking to a small camera, but um, hello, thank you so much. Um, it's a real shame we can't have a live seed swap. I really miss the bustle, I miss the crowds, and I really hope we can all be there next year. But um, I think it's really important that we try in these strange times to learn some skills so that we aren't as dependent on the systems that appear to be breaking down around us. So anyway, um, this is really just a recap of what's already been said on the Eventbrite site and on our start um, page. So I will um, click onwards. Um, there are many reasons to um, save seeds um, and the sort of 10 I've picked out are really that we have a huge ancestry of seeds where generations have refined and chosen and selected and gradually developed hundreds of thousands of different varieties. Um, there'll be a pea that's specifically brilliant for growing in Yorkshire's climate, a bean that will resist the rust down in the soggy southwest and so on. There are thousands of tomatoes thousands of aubergines in India, all sorts of varieties that might have been once just niche to a little village that grew it as a land race and kept it down the years, handed from you know, parent to child. <coughs> Excuse me. So these are very precious. Not only is there a history of our culture embedded in it, but it's also the biodiversity and the gene bank for breeding new varieties to resist new diseases, and simply to provide us with a range of tastes and different uses. The problem is, as we've gone from saving seeds to buying seeds, that regulation has made it quite expensive for small companies to register their seeds. And as a result, um, with the government consulting mostly with the multinational corporations, the lists which are kind of authorised for mainstream sale have become really reduced. Seeds of Italy estimate that we have lost 94% of our heritage varieties, though it might be that some of those are still being kept going by somebody in an allotment in Manchester and somewhere in Spain has got that unique pepper. But whilst they're out there, they're at risk of being lost. So it's very important that we try and share and grow and keep these things going. And just as crops adapted to suit the climate for our forebears. If you have a particular bean that you really like, and if you grow it for year after year, selecting to save seeds from your 10 best plants, you will in time refine it so that that plant, that little stream, becomes more and more suited to your land, to your microclimate and the weather that sort of sweeps through in um, Bristol, which tends to be wet rather than cold, and will have a different sort of subset than if you were selecting the same bean somewhere in the um, dry southeast. So they adapt to your land, be the second reason. And the other reason, rather appropriately for COVID days, is that if you have your own seeds, you're resilient and you're independent. We have had a real flurry of interest in gardening, which is the silver lining to COVID as far as I'm concerned. But it has also highlighted that you can't always rely on the big 
chains and the infrastructures can either break down permanently or temporarily. Um, there's problems with exporting seeds to Ireland because of Brexit. There's problems with lorries queued up in Dover and Calais, probably with lots of seeds waiting that people can't get. So it's better to not to rely on long con continuous chains. Um, <clears throat> on a more positive note, so when you have saved seeds, you tend to have a lot of them. If you have a pumpkin, you might end up with 200, 300 seeds, and that gives you so many options. If they're stored well, you won't need to save that same variety for several years. You'll also have enough to give your friends and neighbours and to barter or trade or swap. And you can afford to grow several plants, several little seedlings for each plant you actually want. And that opens up the possibility for waiting till those seedlings have got you know, four, six leaves, leaves and then choosing the best. So you can avoid, you know, having to grow not quite the best plants because that's all the seeds you've got. And they can be quite expensive. So you can have your choice and you can select all the faster and create that adapted crop, you know, in a fewer number of years. And the seeds, if you have just saved them, they're going to be fresh and they'll grow all the better. Because while seeds store pretty well over a number of years, there is obviously an advantage to something that's doing what nature intended, which is growing the next year. And you may notice a difference between the germination rates on that first season. The next one, other people might not want to always learn more and more about seeds or, you know, tinker and play around but personally I think it's fascinating I really enjoy finding out how to do the next sort of level of seed saving I like making the kit and the gadgets I will admit because um, I like making things but having worked with kids in schools it's also that sort of aspect of showing them how the whole cycle works that seeds go to plants go to seeds go to plants and that isn't about a supermarket giving you your tomatoes out of magic thin air or the tomato machine. So I think that is an important part of education for kids and something to keep your mind working as an adult. Um, if you grow plants on, um, even if you don't do it inverted commas properly to grow from seed, if you allow plants to flower and produce seeds in a more natural way rather than hacking everything down in autumn, you're also giving something to the ecosystem, to the insects, to the birds. And you might end up with some self-seeded things that you don't want, but that's called compost, or you could call it green manure. But it is probably better to allow the ground to be covered by, you know, your self-seeded kale crossed with broccoli, yeah, do kale, well, cabbage crossed with broccoli, um, than to just strip everything down and put down black plastic. Uh, as you go on with learning more about saving seeds, you can actually move on from just trying to select for good crops to actually trying to breed your own varieties, which might entail taking pollen from one version of a tomato and giving it to another in controlled circumstances so you can create your own heritage varieties. And then there's the kind of, shall we say the the downside of why you maybe don't want to buy all the commercial seed. Um, a lot of it is mass produced and shipped from China. Uh, they are, you know, able to produce things more cheaply than us, but it's at the behest of two or three very large agri-industry companies um, who are and are primarily pharmaceutical companies. Their wish to control the seeds is largely because if you design and breed seeds that need chemicals, you get to sell chemicals. And there are some F1 hybrid seeds, which I like and I grow. And I'm trying to find alternatives to those. But for the most part, the limitations on those is that you have to go back every year and you have to buy more, which means they have to get shipped from China every year. So it doesn't do much for your carbon footprint. And as for pushing back against big industries, 
I would say that I think it's wise to do that against any big industry unless we want to have a world that's run by a few billionaires and unanswerable corporations. You know, we need to um, work from the ground up. Um, that's 10 good reasons. I put in the obvious one too, is that if you save seeds, you save money because we tend to like doing that. Um, I have to say one of our team works or has worked in a garden shop. I don't think he actually has an evil plan, but he might have. So if you're going to venture into growing seeds, there's a basic level of questions you need to ask. And it's an unfortunate fact that since gardening became something you do by going to the garden centre or the seed merchants and buying seeds, people have almost forgotten what the most basic things and they don't know what they don't know, if you see what I mean. So the four questions are, is will this plant cross pollinate? And that means that the pollen from one version of squash might go to another squash so that when you sow those seeds, you don't get the, the mother plant duplicated. You get something that's halfway between that and something else. It might still be edible. It might be lovely or it might be disappointing and a waste of space. Worst case scenarios, some plants will actually cross with wild varieties or bring out some kind of recessive gene which can make something actually bad for you. Um, there are cases of courgette poisoning where this has happened. Um, not to be alarmist, but it's a reason why you need to know. Um, the other thing is that some plants are quite happily interbreeding for generations and they remain vigorous and happy. Others, particularly the brassicas, have the equivalent of the kind of Habsburg chin or, you know, become, you know, weedy chinless wonders as they interbreed and narrow down in their gene pool. So you maybe have to have up to 15 plants for some. I've seen a recommendation that you should have 200 corn plants to get strong seeds, which puts it beyond most amateur gardeners, certainly. You also want to think, is a plant an annual? In which case you'll get seeds this year if you leave it, or is it a biannual? If it's not going to seed until next year, is it going to survive the winter outside or do you need to lift roots, store them somewhere and then plant them back out? And that can be something you need to plan around or may have to just write off because you don't have a shed or space in your flat for 25 carrots and 15 beetroot. And the final one is, is it an F1 or an open pollinated heritage variety? F1 seeds are, as I've touched on, a commercially produced seed. They're hybrids and they're very carefully bred from two strains so that when they cross them again to create the hybrids, they know exactly what's going to happen. And this can give you vigorous plants and it can give you ones which are great for commercial production because all your cabbages ripen at once, if that's the term, all your um, sprouts sprout. It's great for com commercial harvesting and they can be good plants. But if you sow seeds, those genes recombine and you get all sorts. And the two photographs here are part of um, an experiment where I have been breeding some F1 plants. So the seeds came from Crimson Crush, which was an F1. So this is the second generation, which would be the F2 generation. And as you can see in the little pot, there's one of the tomatoes that has what we call a potato leaf. It hasn't got the usual lobing that you get on a tomato. And that is something some tomatoes have, but it demonstrates the differences. And um, the lower photograph is, shall we say, the most vigorous and the weediest out of that batch a little later. So if you were getting the more vigorous of those plants, you might be really pleased to think you've got away with it. If you've got the weedy one and what you really need is some tomatoes for your lunchbox, you'd be disappointed. Um, I'll be talking more about the um, my little breeding thing, which is my pet project later. Having gone through those questions, you may be pleased to know there are some where the answer is they're annual, they self-pollinate, they aren't necessarily F1s, 
and they're easy. Um, the four easiest are tomatoes, peas, lettuce and French beans and some wildflowers I'd throw in uh, with a couple of caveats to that. Um, as you can see from the diagram of the tomato plant, the female part, the um, stigma, is actually inside a little tent of anthers. So when the anthers produce pollen, um, it's going to fertilise itself. And you can enhance that by shaking plants to make sure the pollen falls. But essentially, you'd have to be quite unlucky for a tomato not to self-fertilise. So you can save seeds from them without doing anything other than simply letting one of them get really well and um, having a, um, yeah, a small process to clean up the seeds afterwards. Um, the same with peas. They shed pollen while they're still in the state where the stigma is trapped inside the bud with the, uh, the anthers, so they will self-pollinate. Um, French beans, yeah, and lettuce is both just a case of let some go to seed and um, it's ideal if you save for more than one plant because that will um, keep the genetic diversity but um, otherwise no fancy stuff required. And there are two main ways of thinking about how you process seeds. Um, the first is the easiest. Most seeds want to be kept in a dry, cool condition. If you think of the opposite of what you want to do when you're trying to sow seeds and get them to grow, which is to make them moist and warm. So you're trying to make sure they have no water and it's nice and cool so they don't get um, stimulated into starting to grow and then dying or respiring and gradually losing their energy and vigour. The ones on the um, right here, they're in a dehydrator, which um, I appreciate not everyone has, but if you have, they're very useful for mass drying of seeds. And you can start off drying them in your pods, then shell them and then dry them some more if they're beans. And um, I lay them out in tissue or on takeaway lids for the little fine ones so they don't escape through the grids. The other ones, which are a tiny bit more um, work, but I find it quite fun, are things where the seeds come wet. Um, that might be passion fruit, but more usually it's tomatoes. And you can process these to get rid of the gel that covers them by fermenting them. Um, eat pesto, save the jars. Um, either if you're doing quite a lot, you can simply mush up the je jelly bit inside the tomatoes and leave it for three days. Or if you're only doing a few, I find it useful to add a little water. But what happens is that after three days, that mucousy surface will have gone and you will just have clean dry seeds or clean seeds, which you can then dry and store. Um, the gel is there to try and inhibit germination. And if you do just stick it to a paper towel, it's fine for personal use, but we'd really prefer you bring something that looks like processed seeds to the swap so that it doesn't put off beginners and so it's easier to handle. If you haven't got a dehydrator, um, a really good trick for drying seeds is to get a jar with some rice dedicated to the purpose and put that rice in the oven when it's cooling down so it just dries out really super dry. And then you can put seeds into a little bag, bury them into that rice and about two weeks should do it. You actually get your seeds to a really low water content. If you want to go to the full extent of freezing your seeds for long-term storage, you're looking at something like 5% water content. And um, the recommendation is that if they snap or shatter, um, that is probably dry enough. Um, so yeah, um, get hammer, get a bit of wood, hit a bean. Um, if you're dealing with tiny seeds, you're obviously going to struggle to find out if it snaps or if it crushes. So if I was doing something like that, I'd probably put a, a bean in as well, or a few beans as a kind of check so that I can smash them. And if they're okay, then the tiny seeds will be as well. Um, and finally, this is how not to store seeds. Don't leave them in a 
pot in your greenhouse through the winter to get warm and cold and damp and snail eaten because their germination the next year is going to be very low and um, it's just a shame all those little plants that aren't going to happen so um, once you've got past the easy ones which I would definitely recommend that you do as a one-off in your first year before you try and get more ambitious you will find that when you start reading what it takes to make seeds breed true the barriers can seem positively alarming and um, yeah short of putting them on this desert island you do wonder if there's any way of achieving this as an amateur depending on which book you read there'll be you know a, mile and a half needed between a cabbage and a broccoli to prevent them crossbreeding because they're both brassicas or a beetroot might need to be eight mile, eight kilometers away from other beets or sugar beet because they're wind pollinated tiny pollen grains can go an awful long way um, whether you'd actually get much cross pollination at a quarter of that distance if there's buildings and fences and rows of beans is debatable but it does make you um, wonder what is in that packet when you pick something up from the seed swap and it just says beetroot home saved. Is it going to be beetroot or is it going to be partly chard and beetroot? Yeah, um, it's nice to know and you can choose your risks if you do so with a sort of educated level of what could have gone wrong. Um, still worth saving seeds, but I'm um, going to go into some tips for how you make it a little more practical than buying a desert island and a rowboat. The first thing is that if you consider how bees act or how the wind acts, when you have a block of broad beans, the ones in the centre of that block, or comes out any other carrots, anything, um, they are more likely to have been the fifth plant the bee visited and it's probably been to other of your own beans rather than your neighbours. So they're more likely to breed true if you take them from the middle of a block. Similarly, if you've got a garden that's full of flowers and lots of things a bee is going to be interested in, it's less likely to bloody mindedly fly from a broad bean two streets away to your broad beans because it's got so many easier opportunities to get pollen. And the pollen, of course, from a dahlia or a daisy or anything else is not going to germinate with a broad bean. It's just um, far, far too different. So that's one option. The um, other options are partly to work around the fact that if something crosses is how to spot it. And one thing that one of my favourite authors, Carol Depp, suggests is that historically the thing to do would have been to grow contrasting versions of a crop near each other. So if you're going to grow several sorts of bean, put the green beans next to the purple, put the small short dwarf beans next to the tall ones, then if something crosses you're going to know that there's been an intermediate version and you can take it out before it itself flowers and contributes to the next generation. And that is a process that we would call roguing. Um, when you sow home saved seeds, the thing to do, as I've suggested, is to sow more than you need by, you know, five or six fold. And then you can really pick out the best, but you can also remove any that are clearly not true to type. Now, if something's not true to type because it's incredibly vigorous, you might want to quietly shuffle it off somewhere, grow it on and see if it's a worthwhile sport because you might have hit on something fabulous. But quite often, you just know that it's not what you want and just whip it out. Also, once you've gone to a load of effort, one of the things you can do is just to try and work with other people. It cuts down the work, obviously, if one person is being very careful about saving good allium seeds, somebody else is being very careful about lifting carrots, replanting them and letting them grow on in an environment free from Queen's Anne's lace or any other weed that might cross with them. And so with some cooperation and a bit of community spirit, you can actually limit the amount of work you do 
and provide all the seeds for, at least most of the seeds that you need. One way of controlling what your neighbours grow too, so that your runner beans breed too, is to grow lots of runner beans and give your neighbours runner bean plants. Most people will be quite happy to have that shortcut and to save, you know, five or six quid down the garden centre. So you can, as acts of kindness, quietly monopolise your particular corner with the beans of your choice to try and enhance the chance of getting true seeds. And um, finally, the um, other side of sharing, or oh, sorry, the other side of sharing, it's about communication. And at the seed swap every year, the seeds that get left are the ones where the labels on the packets are very vague. It's not surprising that people want to know what they're getting. If you have something that just says squash or tomato, in a famine situation, you grow them. But most of the time, people want to know a bit more. They want to know if it's a winter squash. They want to know if it's a summer squash. If it's a tomato, is it a cordon? Is it yellow? Is it red? You know, people want to know. And it is really just about sharing your stories and making it clear that you knew what you were doing when you're saving it. Um, the labels there are sort of varied and sort of hinting at the kind of information you could give. But even just knowing that somebody has got the knowledge, they don't have to spell out, well, first I built a cage and then I did this and I, you know, they could just say that it's saved the knowledge and that would be great. You know you can trust those seeds. And if someone's in the garden, they might have crossed, you can say, it's 90% certain it'll be okay. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, another ruse is very simply using the best space you can. This is one of my clients' gardens. Um, I do do gardening for other people. And on the other side of the fence in the middle, there's a little enclosed space by a substation, which is um, kind of dead space where I grow her some flowers for her business in exchange for me being allowed to grow a few extra things. And these are black podded runner beans, which is a heritage seed library variety and one that is quite rare. So I was growing it on a busy corner where the flow of traffic and the wind makes it fairly low traffic for bees and insects. And on a quick scout round, I could see no other vegetable plots in the surrounding area. So I felt this is a fairly good bet that these will breed true as a heritage variety. Once you've got a little more confident with seed saving, some of the ones which need extra attention would be all the squashes, cucumbers, melons, courgettes. They are very promiscuous. And though there are three varieties within just the squash courgette family, there's um, a tendency for them interbreed quite broadly. So even if you have a busy garden full of flowers, the recommendation would be that you'd have to have something like 250 metres between courgettes to be sure that them breeding true. And that is impractical. Um, allotment sites within that space, you'd probably have 25 people all growing their favourite version and you can't expect to control that. So the alternative is that you control individual pollination and if you have a wish to grow courgette plants you would have to have a special plant to be the mother plant because once courgettes grow big enough to produce viable seed they are going to stop growing other courgettes for you to eat. For Winter squash, which you'd grow to be very mature anyway, that's not a problem. You simply need to make sure you have a couple of fruit marked very clearly to be saved for seeds. The process um, is that you stop the bees doing what bees do and pollinate the flowers so that you can hand pollinate them. And after a little observation, you learn to spot when a flower is going to open the next day or maybe the day after and you need then to prevent the bees getting there. It has been said in some places that you simply put some tape around those flowers to stop them opening. But bees 
have been known to chew their way through in the bottom and you'll find a little hole where they've gone in after the nectar and the pollen and that's sort of messed that plan up. So putting them in a bag, brightly labelled so you can spot it again with a bit of Christmas ribbon or something means that you are in control and when you come down early the next morning and the flowers open you can pick the male flower, pull off the leaves and use the anthers as like a paintbrush onto the stigma of the female flower. You then have to bag up the female flower again and let it mature and once the petals have dropped you can take the bag off because it's on its way to becoming a fruit and one that will give you true seeds. Um, ideally you could use several male flowers because that will keep the genetic diversity. Um, it's very important to keep labelled the seed, the small fruit that you have pollinated though because otherwise you're going to forget and eat it and um, yeah so bright coloured ribbon comes in handy. Um, other ones depending on your level of ambition most peppers and chilies will cross though there are a subspecies of chili which has black seeds which won't cross with normal ones um, and you can have one chili in your house it'll be fine just allow it to self-pollinate maybe give it a bit of a shake and a bit of a help to do so and you'll end up with seeds that breed true. But once you start having one or two, you might want to make them little net curtain bags or out of horticultural fleece. And you could limit that to just putting a little bag around one branch. Um, the bags you buy these days for re reusable fruit and veg bags could be useful. The kind of gauze gift bags you get for jewellery, worth keeping because they're a ready-made solution. And um, with um, any of these, again, mark which ones are your seed ones, if there's any chance of confusion. Um, the other drawing is of a more ambitious structure, where if you want your brassicas to definitely breed true, you need to be aware that they will cross-pollinate. And if you don't want something that's half cabbage, half sprout, you might want to go to these lengths. They're bee pollinated um, and if you've got them all blocked off and keeping insects out you do then have the problem of how do you get them pollinated. You could whisk the cover off and get very busy with a paintbrush uh, but I have heard of people going to fishing shops and buying a tub of maggots so that um, when the flies develop they buzz around inside the cage. Um, this depends on your squeamishness level and how much of a nerd you are, but there will always be someone in the community who is that nerd and we need them. Um, and hopefully once they've done that, they will have thousands and thousands of seeds and be happy to share them. All right, this is um, now onto my own little personal project. I have, I mentioned, experimented with breeding some from an F1. Uh, in Bristol, we have really bad blight for tomatoes and potatoes. And it does mean that you can lose all your crop really quite quickly um, if you have susceptible plants. Um, it's a virus, um, sorry, fungal um, disease. It blows in on the wind and it likes damp conditions, which, um, yeah, that's Bristol. So um, there have been a number of commercial hybrids created, which are blight resistant. And I started growing Crimson Crush about seven years ago and was quite impressed because it really did survive and it tasted okay. So rather than wanting to be tied into having to buy those seeds every year uh, and they cost maybe 45 pence a seed, um, maybe more this year. You have the possibility of using them as a starting point to see if you can breed back out to get the characteristics you want, which is light resistant in some tomatoes, which you can then just gradually stabilize, keep recombining the genes until you get something that is 
predictable as a starting point for new strains and new breeding or a nice tomato in themselves. Um, this and the tray of seedlings again shows the difference. There's differences in colour, differences in size, and the middle shot is you know I planted them out quite densely because firstly I want to get a lot of plants so I have as much of that variety to look at and select from as possible but also if I'm trying to select for something that's blight resistant I'm doing everything I can perversely to get them to have blight because I need to test them to destruction and that kind of tangle of foliage on the right of the screen is pretty much how not to grow tomatoes. In more normal circumstances, you'd want more air around them, you'd remove spare leaves. You'd try and make sure that the um, fungal spores didn't have a nice warm little microclimate to thrive in. But several years on, um, and this last year was very blighty, I had several strains which stood through and once I'd removed the dying foliage they bounced back and started sprouting again so I'm fairly confident that I do now have three strands one which is similar in shape to that there you can see the tomato uh, sorry I'm, I'm pointing to something which you can't see so the left hand tomato with a little heart shape that is one of the ones that stood pretty well I have a normal roundish one and then I have a beef steak, which are all, I'd say, reliable, predictable. They will grow fairly similar um, children next year and they'll be blight resistant. Um, the beef steak one tastes of nothing, it's pap. But I'm hoping that if I can now cross that with other beef steak tomatoes, I may be able to choose something that has both flavour and the blight resistance. My favourite tomato is Paul Robeson, which is a um, relation of black Russian tomato. Huge amount of flavour, absolutely gorgeous. And if I can get that crossed so that I can grow it outdoors on mass, then that would be wonderful. So, um, yeah, um, to summarise, seed saving can be very easy um, if you start at the simple ones. But you, if you get really interested, you can just keep pursuing it and breed your own crops. Um, there's always something new to learn in gardening and seed saving is kind of closing the loop on what is a big gap for most people's gardening knowledge. So I'd strongly recommend getting involved. It's great. And I think that's probably all I have to say. That was wonderful. Thank you so much for all that, Diane. And yes, please let us know when you have your, your magical tomato variety. <laughs> um, I do have quite a lot of seeds. So if anyone's interested in taking some and experimentally growing them, I'd be very interested to get more people involved and get some feedback. That'd be fantastic. Should, should people uh, email the Bristol Seed Swap if they're interested in that? Um, or you directly? I yeah if you email seed swap and put crimson crush project at the top so I spot the emails and hive them off that would be great um, I have to say I'm not quite sure about the legality I'm fairly sure that it would not be right to sell something that's been developed from somebody else's commercially produced f1 but I think whilst it's in the realm of personal use and swapping we're fine yeah, no money involved then. No. Uh, Claire, do, do you do you have questions? I have a few questions. Just bear with me with my link up. Um, I've got a few. Um, how can you tell if something would cross pollinate with a neighbour plant and create a hybrid? There are lots of good books. Um, I will. At the end of. I had an end slide which has a bibliography which I can put back up in a minute if you like or um, mm -hmm. put up now. Um, there are ones which are harder to keep pure but almost any family will interbreed um, much as the way that you could in theory get a chihuahua to cross with a Great Dane. Um, you can get a chive to cross with a leek but 
chances are they won't be flaring um, exactly at the same time or you know the closer they are the more likely they are to breed but it takes a little research which to be honest there's some very good sites out there and um, the real seed company have a whole site on how to seed save there's um, a website called DIYseeds.com that has numerous videos for different varieties and there are several good books um, which is worth investing in before you spend a lot of time. Um, that, are, was one the, that was one of the next questions Di Diane, is, is there any books that you, you would recommend? Uh, yeah, I if I knit back onto sharing the screen if I can, um, huh. there we go, um, that would be my go-to list. Um, I think I mentioned my favourite author is Carol Depp. Her books are very readable. Uh, in the way that you could read a novel. It's a fairly personalised account of how she grows, why she grows. But it isn't sort of um, unrealistic. Some of her ideas about how to isolate and how to get around the problems come from her. Um, there are also some very good sort of basic books. Um, Back Garden Seed Saving is, I think, fairly much British based and yeah, quite easy to access. The Manual Seed Saving has a lot more in-depth information, but because it's maybe more international, there are some gaps. It doesn't mention sprouts, for instance. Um, maybe this is just something the English eat, the British. Um, and yeah, seed to seed is another classic one that everyone recommends and very informative and clearly laid out. So that would be my list. If anyone wants to do a quick screen grab of that. <laughs> I've got a few, a few questions. Um, if tomatoes are self-pollinating, then how do you cross-pollinate and hybridise them? So which ones? Tomatoes? The tomatoes, yeah. yeah. Sorry. Um, you're getting down to tweezers and paintbrushes and possibly magnifying glasses at that point. So it is a case of I will be looking out to get flowers before they're fully mature and bagging them. And then for the male flowers, it's a case of carefully peel off the petals and use the um, anthers to pollinate some flowers, which I'd then bag up and mark. So it's fiddly and I'm not expecting to get 100% success. So I will be trying to do that in sort of successive days with different flowers and have you know plants allocated for this is the one I'm crossing with Paul, Paul Robeson, this is the one I'm going to try crossing with Mamand and so on. Um, so yeah it's experimental but people do it and um, I have a very old um, book on genetics and seed saving from 1945 which explains things in delightfully you know nothing detail which is I find helpful. So. Okay, next question. The lady's coming in, Diane, so <laughs> just bear with me. Um, what would you consider to be something good to save seed from uh, with children in a school setting? Um, I'd say French beans because they're big and manageable. Um, they make nice, impressive plants and they're pretty. Um, there's so many different varieties of beans. Um, one of my favourites is tunny bean and each one has a kind of little yin yang of white and rust brown and then you get sort of the dark brown black shiny Cherokee shadow of tears beans you know you can um, you can get overexcited looking at bean catalogues if you're so like me and end up with far too many varieties of beans but they are lovely little things and they almost they always breed true if you want to be super careful, you'd have them 10 metres apart, but crossing will be minimal. Two seconds. Um, I'm getting there. <laughs> um, question on genetic diversity. Um, if you were to start with a packet of 10, save seed and grow 80 plus plants the following year, is that safe for genetic diversity for one that requires that great populations i.e. outcrosses or should one start with several packets first for better diversity? Um, I think you can do it with one year you use one packet and maybe buy a second packet and intermix them. You'd need to sort of look up the recommendations 
And I have to say the books are not all consistent as to how many you need for any particular thing. Um, the back garden seed saving one tends to err on the size of what's possibly practical for amateur gardeners. Um, some of the others, they, I think they must assume you have an acre or two. Um, but if you were to grow those 10 seeds on and keep seeds from a good number of those plants and then next year maybe introduce the second packet you could try and make sure that the strength of the strain kept going um, and go back to Carol Depp she says that if you buy seeds from different seed merchants you may even find that they've slightly diverged in the strains so that by buying one from one merchant and one from another you could you know recombine them and that will help too to get things back to full vigour. Okay. Um, I've got one here. What temperature do you set the dehydrator to? Um, it shouldn't be above 35 degrees, and that's a really good point. Some dehydrators claim to be 35 degrees, but actually go over that. And once you've cooked a seed, that's it, curtains. Um, so if you're buying a dehydrator, it would be worth maybe reading the reviews and asking those questions, but also having received it is put a thermometer in there and run it at its lowest setting and check. Um, you know, if it's too hot, then um, send it back to the manufacturer and explain why. And then they'll have to work their thermostats. Um, but yeah, the Chinese even have an expression for someone who's no use by calling them a cooked seed. So, yeah. Okay. I've got the other one. Um, how long can you freeze seeds uh, for and how do you bring them back to life? The length of time I think is probably in decades if you've done it properly but if you were thinking about your own personal seed bank I would try and get them out, regrow them and circulate them every five or six years, ten at maximum. The commer not the commercial, the um, the proper seed banks, um, the ones that are trying to preserve uh, um, genetic material for the whole globe, they go down to really cold temperatures, but they also take out a lot of the moisture and the plant's seeds are still alive. That tiny little germ inside the seed is still ticking over, but at a very, very low rate. So the colder and drier something is, the longer it will last. But um, in domestic settings, yeah. I haven't been doing it long enough to have anything to test over five years, but I got good germination for those. And um, I'd be fairly confident it would go longer, but you just might have to plant more. Um, I've got a few more still. Does humidity affect storage? Absolutely. Um, the drier something is, the longer it will last. The, the seeds are alive and they are very slowly metabolizing but that metabolism depends on the amount of moisture and the amount of warmth they have and they also need oxygen to some small degree so um, yeah the drier you can get them the better um, if you've got seeds um, in the freezer um, and you want to bring them out to sow it's best if you're only going to take some of them out to get them back to room temperature before you open the packet so you don't get any um, condensation going inside the packet for instance and then you take out the ones you want reseal it refreeze it um, but the um, yeah the enemy of survival is moisture which is why you shouldn't leave your seeds in the greenhouse over winter perfect um, what do you think of the seed videos on social media that show half a pepper being put in a pot and plants growing from it is it really that easy um, I am hugely exasperated and annoyed that the generations of people are being misled about how you garden. Um, the people who produce those videos are content farms. They have hangar sized warehouses full of stage sets where people are just paid to turn out fast cut, colourful, gimmicky bollocks. Pardon my French. Um, <laughs> You know, there's a really good debunk um, video. Um, one of the YouTube channels I follow, Epic Gardening, he has taken apart one of those um, garden hack ones and 
you know, some of the seeds coming up from the pepper he recognised as I did as cucumber, some of the things are simply never going to work. And although it could be said that it demonstrates maybe to kids the cycle of food to seeds, children can be taught the correct way of doing things. They're not stupid. Um, and why teach them the wrong way of doing things? Um, so, yeah, I find it really saddening um, when, you know, it could disillusion someone who tries that and all they get is nasty rotten gunk rather than food. Perfect. Um, what's the right way to store seeds in packets and do you abide by the sell-by dates? Um, if they're in packets then you can get some of those little dehydrator sachets. You probably acquire a few every time you buy a pair of shoes or a piece of technology and you could dry them back out by sitting them on the radiator or in a very low oven. And if you put one of those in, again, it will help keep the seeds dry. Um, keep the packets well sealed um, and possibly put them in a Tupperware tub. If you've got space in the fridge, the fridge is good because again, cold, dry in the tub. Um, and the sell by dates and use by dates, I think could be taken with a pinch of salt if you were using um, those kind of methods of storage. You might need to sow a few more. You might notice a drop of vigour, um, but most seeds will be okay. Um, there's stories of, you know, the pea that was found in the Egyptian tomb that was sown and grown. Um, if you dig up a Victorian wall, a rose bay will the herb will sprout from beneath where it's been buried for a century. Um, Seeds are sort of little time capsules, so some won't last. Parsnips are notoriously bad after the first year, but in general, a year or there, go for it. Okay. Um, I've lost where I am now. Um, so I was asking about if they buy if they buy spuds from the shops, uh, their favourite spuds from the shops, um, can they use them? Can they use same potatoes to grow the same ones. If the Americans cut them up and use one or two eyes for seed. Yeah, um, cutting them up perfectly valid. Um, it's best to um, do that. Even if, you, even if you don't normally chip your potatoes, it's best to cut them up and let them get hard before you put them in the ground. Um, and um, that way is one way of making a few go further. There is debate about whether you risk introducing disease by buying bought potatoes because seed potatoes are generally grown in areas, particularly I think Scotland has a very large um, market in that, um, where there isn't disease and they're very scrupulously checked. Um, so, you know, I think if you do use shop bought potatoes, you just need to be a bit vigilant and do a little bit of research as to what you should look at. So if there's any sign of disease, you need to hike them out and burn them for your sake and for your neighbours, um, if you're on an allotment site. Um, if no one else in your street is growing them, it's just your problem. But yeah, um, after all, we haven't always been shipping in seed potatoes from elsewhere, but the um, diseases often hang around and once you've got them, it's a problem from there for years, so best to avoid. Um, another one about freezing seeds. When freezing, do you have to suck the air out of the packet first? I wouldn't bother. I mean, because they are alive and they are respiring, they do need a bit of air, um, but minimal amount. But it's the cool and the um, dry, which is preserving them. Perfect. Um, another couple more questions. Um, any good quick tips for sorting rosemary seeds? Someone's currently sorting through, she's got a load of them. And she's trying to get them out of the dried flour. And the dried flour is proving rather taxing. Um, I've never really done rosemary seeds. Um, a lot of small seeds is often a case of putting them in something like a fleece, horticultural fleece bag, and just scrunching them um, and then sieving them. The um, I mean, I've got now lots of different sieves and different size gauge things um, to try and get them. But the smaller the seed, the trickier it can be to get them clean. Um, so 
I have to say that that isn't one I can really give much on. Sorry. It's all right. <laughs> um, <laughs> I've got a few more. They keep coming in. Um, best ways to dry seeds without heat, so without a dehydrator. Um, the jar of rice is the best bet. Yeah. Um, you can start them off just anywhere that's got a decent airflow and not in the direct sun, perhaps because again you don't want to cook them. But if you have a breezy sort of window sill, um, you can get them down to sort of you know half the way there and then put them in with some very dry rice and the rice absorbs moisture out of them over a couple of weeks so that should get you something which will um, shatter or break uh, and that's the kind of point at which you know it's probably safe to freeze and I have to say that because I don't take anything much on faith when I first tried doing this I did freeze some beans defrost some and test them for germination and they did all germinate so that does seem to work um can you name some companies who you would feel okay to buy seeds from yeah Sorry. um there's real seeds who are um currently swamped if you look at their website they um are struggling to keep up the demand there's a newer one called vital seeds which have the same kind of ethical organic and um local ethos and there's one called beans and herbs who she does do more than beans and herbs but she has lots and lots of heritage beans and um, I'm trying not to buy any more because I love them as I may have said I do like my French beans. Um, there's other ones which are maybe one step up and more traditional. Um, King's is still of, I think it's still a family owned business but it's one that's been going a long time and has not yet been bought up by one of the big ones so um, they cater to a lot of allotment sites and um, I'd say you have a reasonably good range of open heritage varieties as well as the F1s so. Are we okay for a couple more questions? I can keep going yeah I've got two more here. I got, uh, <laughs> can you explain the connection between Big Power and Big Seed companies? Big Power, sorry. Big Para, P A R A. That's what I've got on here. Big Pharmaceutical. Pharma. Oh, big yeah. Power Pharmaceutical. Pharma. Yeah. Um, yeah. The. Um, hope there's no lawyers listening. Um, unfortunate fact is some of the big companies are also notorious for litigating. So. Um, I doubt they'll find me, but companies like Monsanto started off with um, an interest more in chemicals and have got into seeds. And once the possibility was there for seeds to be bred through um, genetic engineering and for seeds to be and mm -hmm. genetic material to be patented, even if it's been sort of um, produced by natural means, that meant that they could then start engineering seeds to need their chemicals. So one of the first um, things to be created was a corn that could be sprayed with glyphosate and survive. Uh, and the glyphosate would take out all the other weeds. Um, this means that you have to buy the seeds every year and you have to buy the, and you're doing it in order to then buy the chemicals to drench your land kill the soil and because nature likes to stick two fingers up at people we now have super weeds that are also glyphosate resistant um, other sort of links are the sort of need for these crops to have extra fertilizer um, extra pesticides and it's all kind of I think we're calling business terms is broadening their scope so that they cover in all aspects, not just of um, seed production, but all the things that go around it to um, make farmers utterly dependent on an integrated system that feeds money in one direction to them. Um, and they are, you know, um, big companies with only the legal obligation to maximise money to their shareholders and um, companies do not have morals. Um, and they do generally have lawyers and yeah farmers have had their crops polluted by pollen blowing in and have then been sued for 
stealing that genetic material even though they didn't want it so you know um what's not to love um i think i'll make this our final question what do you think about saving your seed potatoes will it lead sorry will it lead to potato blight if your potatoes didn't have blight it can't store blight but if there's the slightest suggestion you have blight then don't save the potatoes because you're just setting up a problem for yourself and wasting space um, I think if you can't get anything else then save them but be very scrupulous about the ones you pick um, you could even watch wash them in Milton fluid before storing them just if there's anything on the surface that isn't showing it it would just slightly improve the possibility of them you know not getting infected and you'd want to check on them through winter wherever you've got them stored somewhere nice and cold and dark and make sure there's no sign of anything you know starting and if there's something starting destroy the lot <laughs> I mean you know um, space and time are precious um, you know it's unless you're really stricken it's a false economy sometimes Perfect. Well, i think that's all the questions i okay. i can see in our chat thanks for all the questions guys <laughs> if i've missed you out i'm sorry <laughs> well thank you for that we were very on a little bit that was fantastic thank you yes thank you diane and thank you claire for doing all the q a